Now, government-owned land remains vulnerable to invaders and trespassing. That's according to Public Works Minister Patricia DeLille. Her department has experienced 53 land invasions on its property since last year. In 32 of those cases, it was in fact unable to prevent land invasions and had to press trespassing charges or eviction orders. The worst hit areas, we are told, are in Mtata in the Eastern Cape. That's followed by Port Elizabeth, uh, Nelstrait in Umpumalanga and in Durban. The Minister uh, joins us now. She's in Cape Town. She joins us via our video link. Good morning, uh, Minister. Thanks very much for your time this morning. I, I want to start off by asking you this, Minister. We talk about, you know, um, land invasions uh, always as if it is this criminal thing that people do undertake. Is it naive to ask the question and say, these are people who need a place to stay, who often need to stay closer to the city centre for job opportunities, and they're doing this out of that need? Uh, Michelle, I will, I will agree that we have not really dealt effectively with apartheid spatial planning. Um, our people are still far away from opportunities, and people have to travel long distances. Sometimes they spend more than 40% of their income just on traveling to and from work. But we also have to secondly make sure that we uh, observe the rule of law and that uh, the housing program must be able on the basis of a waiting list of people who have applied for houses also follow that due process. We have put several strategies in place now uh, to work with the municipalities, to work with the community so that we can be alerted about land invasions. Uh, in 32 instances of land invasions, we have not been successful to stop the invasion, but we have then turned to the courts for eviction or trespassing. And it is a problem around the country so the, the part of the solution is that, you know what, especially in, in, in the major cities because of urbanization, many people are moving to the cities. And so our housing development strategy must recognize that urbanization is a reality. Yeah. Uh, Minister, it's interesting that you talk about, you know, the importance of the country's housing program and for us to allocate housing according to the list. But by the same token, we know the corruption that has plagued that very list when it comes to allocating houses. In fact, just on our channel over the last uh, week or so, I think, we spoke to a 100-year-old woman who had been on the list and applied to be on the list several times over the years who was only now getting a house. Apologies for that. We don't have a great yes. sound connection there to uh, Minister Patricia De Lille as she joins us via video link in Cape Town uh, while our sound engineers try to fix that. Uh, these are just some of the questions that we want to speak to Minister De Lille about. It certainly is corruption around the housing program. And I was just telling you about uh, that 100 year old woman who says she's waited for decades to get her, uh, her house after uh, being on the list for, for many, many years, and that house was only now in the pipeline for her. Uh, we also want to talk about the measures being used when it comes to cracking down on land invasions. Minister, I think we have you uh, back with a better sound connection now. Please continue to talk to us yeah. about the corruption that has plagued our housing list for decades. Yes, most definitely. I was saying, Michelle, that corruption steals from the poor. It is poor people that suffer because of corruption. And therefore, the attempt by government right now to deal with the scourge of corruption, we need to see more people being prosecuted, being put in jail, not put in parliament. Then, you know, we will send up a strong message that corruption will not be tolerated. But as we uh, uh, deliver housing, the corruption with the waiting lists where people are put before elderly people, you find sometimes young people who are not even married mm. who are living in some of these houses. It is a problem that all three spheres of government must work together to root out corruption. But we also need to speed up 
the delivery of houses to those people that qualify to receive a house from government. Now, Minister, you and I have spoken many times over the years, including when you were mayor of Cape Town. And one of the key conversations I remember having with you is this issue around apartheid spatial planning, which you mentioned at the start of our interview, and the housing injustice that comes with it. And one of the programs that you had tried to implement, certainly uh, in Cape Town, was to bring people quite literally closer to the city centre. There was that high-rise building that you wanted to convert into low-cost housing. How are we doing as a country when it comes to bringing our people closer to the city and by doing so, closer to opportunities? I think the indictment for, for South Africa is that we continue with a special spatial planning by buying cheap land outside of the cities and urban areas and building houses for people there. What I attempted to do in the city of Cape Town was to identify the well-located land close to existing transport, more than 12 pieces of land, and release that for integration of our cities. You still find that our cities are not integrated. And that program of integrating our cities, dealing with apartheid spatial planning, must continue. Even now, in October last year, the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure released uh, 14 pieces of land to the Department of Human Settlements. And some of those pieces of land are very well located land. And it's not only national government that sits on land. You, you've got your metropolitans, your municipalities, provincial governments. They all need to come. I mean, but uh, the, the, uh, the, the issue in the city of Cape those 12 pieces of land that was going to help us with integration and bringing people closer to, to work opportunities, they were all cancelled in the end. I mean, these are all great plans that are always, we hear year after year, these are plans that are in the pipeline, Minister, and, and you and I know very well that our people have waited for long enough and the last thing they need is to hear, yes, we have these great plans in the pipeline. When do we see these great plans in action? Well, I can agree with you that people are seeing a sick and tired of the actual plan. We do not need to in those plans. You know, people, people have been waiting for many years. But even where we have the plans, it is always good to do social facilitation, to go to the community and tell the communities about the plans. But I agree with you, it is a lot of talk, yeah. but where we are right now, we must not test the patience of our people. People are sick and tired of waiting. There are great opportunities. I mean, all of these pieces of land that you see currently being invaded, you can see it's coming closer and closer to the cities to where there are work opportunities is because people cannot afford you know, all the money that they spend on transport yeah. to travel. Yeah. So I really hope that we can all come together as all three spheres of government and begin to make these plans happen and get the plans to be implemented. Yeah, I would say it's about time. Minister, we are struggling with our audio connection, but I want to try and squeeze in one more question with you. And, you know, you touched on corruption a little earlier and, you know, you talked about South Africans also wanting to see real action in governments tackling of corruption, especially in the wake of uh, all of the COVID-19 corruption uh, allegations we're hearing about. You've spoken to Parliament just this week about your uh, DG, who is, I believe, still on precautionary suspension around uh, uh, charges of state funerals. That's 76 million rand that was charged uh, for three state funerals, uh, I believe it was, was last year. Uh, Minister, what is the latest with that case? And you know, aside from precautionary suspension, what happens now to your uh, DG? Uh, Michelle, for me, it's very painful that all our heroes and our legends of the struggle, that when they pass on, their names need to be tainted with allegations of corruption. In the case of the DG, he's also got a right to defend himself, and therefore the legal teams have been appointed on both sides. Uh, they are now discussing dates for the pr process uh, to start, and he will be able to put his side of the story, 
And then once the conclu after the conclusion of the disciplinary hearing, then of course the findings will be made public. Yeah. But it's currently in a disciplinary pr process. But Minister, you wanted changes to the policy around how state funerals are conducted. Yes. Yes, we have started with the amendment to the, the policy of state funerals and official funerals. Uh, there is now a document that's been circulating uh, with, within government departments. And the proposals that we have made from public works, because we are responsible for, for infrastructure at state funerals, is that we need to look at putting a cap on how much government can afford to spend on state and official funerals. Yeah. We're also making a proposal that possibly we can give the donation to the family. Yeah. Within my department, the interim arrangements that we've put in place is to say that we keep on renting and buying chairs and buying covers and all of that. We need to procure that so that we own that infrastructure Minister, instead I'm, of I'm, renting I'm so it. Sorry to... We have reduced the cost. Minister, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I think we have the gist of your answer there. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for our interview. Thank you so much, as always.